Uh, we'll have uh, John Wise next, uh, talking about the reionizer, how you see Dwarf Galaxy. Thanks, Tom. So I'll be spending this talk talking about the building blocks of the galaxies that we want to focus on for the, the simulation comparison project. And I'll be going over some recent work that my collaborators and I have been doing. Uh, Tom, Mike Norman, Britton Smith, and Matthew Turk is in the room also. So I want to start this with uh, some open questions on how the first stars affect the first galaxies and what kind of physics we actually have to uh, study in these simulations. So, so I mean, how do these first stars, so these first stars, there have been, the recent work, the simulations have been showing that binaries are, are possible in these early, um, I'm getting feedback, uh, early, uh, early structure formation and how their supernova enrich the halos that go on to form these first galaxies, how they contribute to reionization and how this heated IGM accretes into these early dwarf galaxies. And how does the, these first stars actually affect the, the formation of these first galaxies? And another thing that I'll, that I'll concentrate on slightly today is why do current models of, of uh, galaxy formation overpredict star formation, which Javier uh, classifies forming too many stars a high, high Z problem? And how do these dwarf galaxies depend on environment, whether they're close by within an overdense region or an isolated region, and whether these uh, first stars leave any imprint on dwarf galaxies? So we do simulations using ENZO, and all the simulations I'll be showing, they're all small scale. And this allows us to, they're small scale, so that allows us to look at very high resolution uh, regions inside the galaxy. And they all consider a coupled radiation transfer using adaptive ray tracing, both that, that works both in optically thick and thin regimes. So first to set, set the stage before I move on to galaxy formation uh, is what the radiation feedback does to these host mini halos. So here I, I show a projection of depth, gas density, and temperature of a mini halo that has around a million solar masses. So it forms a star in this H2 region, breaks out, and forms this butterfly-shaped H2 region. And because it drives this 30 kilom kilometer per second shock here, it drives all of the gas out of the mini halo, leaving behind a very poor metal or gas-poor halo. And this just sets the stage, or if you can think of it as initial conditions for galaxy formation. And so you can, if you can think afterwards, you're left with all these gas poor mini halos that go on to merge and form larger and larger halos, you would have some suppressed star formation in these galaxies, just because you have less fuel for star formation. So that just sets the stage for these dwarf galaxies to form. And some details about the simulation I'll be showing you today, it's one cove moving megaparsec across, and we both have, we have both population two and population three star feet stellar feedback and formation. And we set this uh, density threshold to form stars at 1,000 cubic uh, particles per cc. Has uh, radiation pressure, or radiation uh, transfer. Its mass resolution is just below 2,000 solar masses, and its maximal spatial resolution is a tenth of a parsec. And we transition from POP3 stars to metal-rich star, or POP2 star formation, because they have different model. They have a uh, you know, different stellar characteristics at around at uh, 10 to the minus 4 solar. I mean, this is slightly unknown, but we've done parameter studies, and our results aren't that sensitive to this choice. And because the IMF of POP3 stars, it's, it's pretty uncertain right now, but, but we, uh, we assume some Krupa-like IMF, which is just a saltpeter IMF, a high mass, and it's exponentially, ex exponentially cut off below the characteristic mass, which we chose to be 100 solar masses in the, in the work that will be shown today. So just to illustrate this, we have in POP3 stars, we have our typical uh, type 2 supernova in between 9 and 40, and black hole formation above this in, in uh, parent stability supernova in between 140 and 260. And with some IMF, you get a good mix. You get, a pro you get around one third of the stars forming uh, their instability supernovae, and, some, and most of the other fraction forming black holes. So what do we see? 
This is the full box. We have density, temperature here, metals from pop three stars, metals from pop two stars. So you can see, because these pop three stars are very short-lived, they only live for three million years, they create its, these H2 regions. And they're very short-lived, and they quickly recombine. And associated with some of these stars, you can see the metals are ejected. And this volume fill fraction of these metals is around 15%, or no, sorry, 4% is the volume fill fraction, but 15% of the metal or of the, of the mass is enriched in the simulation. And this, these metals go on to, to, uh, to promote the formation of these metal enriched stars. And we have around 300 uh, population three stars forming in, in this uh, simulation going on to form 40 dwarf galaxies. So I want to focus on the mass accretion rates and the st star formation rates of these, the five most massive halos. So this black line is the most massive halo. You can see it's around a billion solar masses at redshift seven, and our next four halos are right around 10 to the, 10 to the eight solar masses. But you can see that this most massive guy, he forms around two million solar masses of stars by redshift seven, but even though these four other halos, they have roughly the same uh, total mass, their stellar mass can, can vary by an order of magnitude. And this just becomes, or comes from how much gas is available for star formation, just based on what kind of star they form, what kind of population three star they form, if they had produced, I mean, by random chance in our simulation, because we sample from the IMF, if they, if they host a supernova, it'll become extremely metal poor. You can see in this situation, it's, in this situation, uh, it was photo evaporated. Uh -oh. Stop working. Do you have a laser pointer? This one stopped working. Oh, there it goes. No. It becomes uh, photo evaporated from some nearby halo. Then it hosts a supernova. And it completely drives all the, all the gas out. And it slowly rec recovers from uh, further mergers and smooth accretion from the IGM. And this translates into a, a very low stellar mass content of this in this dwarf galaxy. But if you have more gas to, to form stars, you can have, I mean, it just, we haven't really come up with a, a relation in between, in between a stellar mass and gas fraction, but they vary in between one and 5%. So if we look at, their luminosities versus the, the halo mass, you can see that they have these low mass halos which can't cool by uh, atomic Klein cooling yet. They primarily depend on molecular hydrogen cooling is the scatter because they can't cool rapidly, they can't form stars very efficiently. So they have a very low mass to light ratio in between the thousand to three thousand or even 10,000 and but the most massive halos in their simulation, you can start forming stars more efficiently through line cooling, and you get more or lower mass to light ratios. But the scatter is just due to what kind of population three star it actually host, is progenitor is ho hosted. So I only have time to focus on the most massive halo, and we can take a closer look at here. So here's the density you can see. It has a very complicated gas structure, you can see in its temperature, we have these star forming regions that have cooled by molecular hydrogen cooling down to around a thousand, or around a thousand Kelvin. And this is a uh, composite plot of metallicity. So the, the red is from pop three, or pop two stars, and the blue is from, from uh, pop three stars. But it's very well mixed. We don't see any metal free gas inside of this, uh, inside of this galaxy. And it has roughly a, a mean metallicity of 10 to the minus two. So here's just a, a volume rendering of this. You can see it's, it's very fractal in nature and you can see all the bubbles that are produced by both the radiation feedback and supernova blast waves. So I might mention that red is cold and blue is, is hot. And if we look at the formation of this, of this galaxy, you can see all of these many halos forming in 
in forming stars, heating up the IGM, they'll go on to form this galaxy. And all of the metals that, that are produced by these, these POP3 stars. And what you can see is all of this gas, all of these metals are blown out into IGM, but since they, it never really escapes this overdense region, and it starts to fall back into this, into this galaxy. And at the very end, you can see these, these uh, metal, out, metal rich outflows coming out of the galaxy as well. So we can actually look at the star formation history of this dwarf galaxy. Each, each point here represents a star particle, and its, its size is related to, the, to its mass. So you can see that in the end, it self-enriches itself. You have a lot of scatter here, because these are formed in different halos. You have its progenitors were had different environments or formed different, had different environments or different uh, population three star, star progenitors. And, but this goes on. So that all uh, goes on to merge into this dwarf galaxy. And then it self-enriches itself to around almost 10 to the minus one, or a tenth of solar. But you can see this increase right here when it reaches around a redshift of eight. This is actually when it can cool but atomic line cooling. And so you have this increase in metal enrichment, and this actually creates this bimodal uh, metallicity distribution function. And what we find is in this metallicity distribution function that only 2% two two of the stars have a uh, metallicity of below minus 3, or 10 to the minus 3 of solar. And we can use as a rough guide uh, by, by seeing if uh, our simulations actually produce some, some, something realistic. I mean, it's a, it's a far, far reach, but you can only consider uh, this. I mean, once you have these stars, they're not going away. So if we look at this, the average metallicity of these stars, we can compare them to uh, local dwarf galaxies. And, he, and in local dwarf galaxies, you have this nice relationship in between the total luminosity and its, or total luminosity and its metallicity. And for this, this galaxy has a, I think, has a luminosity of around 10 to the 7, or, yeah, it's around 10, a few times 10 to the 7, and it's right around the metallicity of this. Because it's hard to really reduce the metallicity of the galaxy. I mean, you have to accrete some, accrete some pristine material through a cold flows or a pristine IGM, and then you can lower it. But then you have to battle against, I mean, in situ star formation within the galaxy. So I can, so what we've done, I mean, this model, we, we on purpose, we, we ignored, we neglected a lot of physical processes just because we wanted a base model that we can in, slowly introduce new physical proper, or physical processes. So something that's, I mean, that we varied is the characteristic mass of POP3 stars, how that affected things in uh, galaxy formation, the critical metallicity of transitioning to POP3 star, two, two stars, uh, Lyman Warner background, no molecular cooling. This, this I mean, I'll talk about this later. Uh, if you have no molecular hydrogen cooling, this effectively shuts off star formation in any many halos. And so you only form stars in, in halos above 10 to the 8 solar masses. Uh, no pop 3 star formation, streaming velocities, etc. cetera. And, and uh, what happens when we include metal cooling and metal cooling and radiation pressure. So this is the cosmic, uh, the, the global star formation rates that we found in, in, these, uh, in these simulations. So you can see the pop 3 star star formation rates are pretty steady. You still have, uh, because the volume filling fraction is only uh, 3%, you still have a lot of pristine regions that, are, 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 that can form pop 3 stars. So it, we don't yet see this, the pop 3 star formation rates going down any, but I mean, this, it should go down around, I can't say anything about that, because we can't run it past rush of seven seven or six because it's such a small box. But you can see there's, there's very little variations in between these models except for a few outliers. This one right here is when we ne neglect star formation in mini halos. So you can see all of a sudden it starts to form stars once the halos are, 
are large enough to actually uh, atomically cool and form stars. And this with uh, metal cooling. Once it forms stars, we see this classical overcooling problem. And so it, it overcools and produces way too many stars, and it ionizes the whole box. So I'll focus on those two simulations. Sorry, John, yes. Sorry, if you said it. When you go from pop 3 to pop 2, you change the IMF, the yields? Yes. All of the above. Yeah, all of the above. So, I mean, in the pop 3 model, we're simulating one star at a time, where the pop 2 stars, they have a regular saltpeter IMF. Saltpeter IMF. Yes. Yeah, to standard uh, photon luminosities. And so what happens if you neglect many halos? So here's what I showed before, but without any many halos, you start overproducing stars. And it's just really dramatic if you, if you uh, neglect many halos. And this comes from the simple fact, if you don't have any star formation within many halos, your gas fraction in, in, the, in, the, in the halos that host dwarf galaxies, it's around the cosmic fraction. If you have more fuel, you have more fire. So, and that's what we see that's causing that. And we actually saw this in a paper that, in some of my thesis work. That was, uh, so this is without any star formation, any star formation within many halos, you'll see this nice centrally concentrated galaxy with a gas fraction of around, around cosmic fraction. But with star formation, this is reduced to around 8% instead of 4, 16% here. And this is surrounded by a heated IGM that it has to accrete from. So this is, I mean, something that we should worry about, I think, in this, in this comparison project. I mean, how to actually, I mean, what do we do about the things that we're not resolving? And how will we consider this? Do we have to consider inhomogeneous reionization? Or, I mean, I think that would be something to talk about tomorrow. So moving on to the effects of radiation pressure. So here I show a comparison with the base model that I, that I showed Yesterday, or not yesterday, but I showed uh, earlier in the talk with metal cooling and radiation pressure. So here, something to see is this metal-rich bubble right here is, is smaller than, than the base model, but it's really, it's not, it didn't launch an outflow because it's overcooling. So they had this almost uh, around a tenth to solar uh, metal pocket right here that's just confined within the galaxy. And where radiation pressure, this further drives uh, these, uh, produces these outflows. But I think because it, it stirs turbulence, and, and so this further met, mixes the ejecta. And so you have a lower, you have a, you have a lower metallicity. So you have less cooling, and, and thus it, it regulates star formation in this galaxy. And it, you can see that it's much much more mixed in here. And we can see this further in these density temperature uh, phase plots. So here's the base model. This is supernova ejecta, but you can see that in the warm phase, you can see it's around 10 to the minus 2 solar. But when we, when we have metal, consider metal cooling, all of these metals are confined in the, in the cold ISM. So you can see none of it really mixes in, in this uh, underdense ISM. But when we have radiation pressure, this, this provides an additional impetus of, of mixing the metals in the ISM, and it reduces this overcooling problem that we, that, we pre, that we experienced when we only consider metal cooling. And this translates. If you have a more metal-rich metal uh, cold ISM, this will directly translate into the more metal-rich uh, metallicity distribution function of the stars. And so, so this blue line is from the base model with metal cooling, you can see that since the dense gas that goes on to form stars was much more metal rich, this translates into more metal rich stellar population. And this is a, a tiny galaxy. I mean, this is the total mass is just around 10 to the 8 solar masses. And if we take the local dwarf galaxies as a kind of a guide of checking whether this is realistic or not, this falls way above the. Um, Lum metallicity and luminosity relationship. But this, this is, uh, with radiation pressure, you can see that the metal mixing that's, that occurs from this additional turbulence that's produced by radiation pressure. I mean, radiation pressure has been understood to be a very important process in the local, in the, in the Milky Way, and in, in star formation, uh, in the star formation community. 
And I mean, it's, it's nothing new, but, but this clearly demonstrates that, well, I guess it died now, that, that is an important process that we, that we should consider in these simulations. And just to visually show you how this, uh, where the radiation pressure actually takes effect, it's not, it's a non-local process, so it's, it actually, it tra trans or transmits the momentum from the ionizing radiation to where is, where is it absorbed. So these are the, this is a slice of radiation pressure, sorry. And so you can see that the radiation pressure is the greatest at the ionization front. So these are individual H2 regions inside the, inside the galaxy. You can see this translates into the dense shells that are created from the H2 around these uh, stellar clusters. And you can see the supernova feedback happening inside of these H2 regions in the middle, middle rich pockets here. And just to, as a teaser, I just want to show this movie. It's, uh, so we're applying the same physics that we found, that we used in this, in this work to a much larger box. So we can look at larger galaxies. So here's, you can see all these H2 regions here. So it's just, and we have, I mean, it's, it's slightly worse resolution, but, but it's, a, it's a 40 uh, co-moving megaparsec box with zoom in region of five co-moving megaparsecs. And so all I've gotten to is around reach of 16. And I'll put up my conclusions right now that I hope I showed you that ray of feedback and chemical feedback play an important role in forming these first galaxies. And these pop three stars, they, they have this, they generate this metallicity floor of around 10 to the minus three of solar. And this, this agrees very well with this uh, metallicity floor that's observed in DLAs and halo stars. And it, pop three, differing pop three stellar feedbacks can, can uh, produce scatters and mass to light ratios within these dwarf galaxies. And, and I've shown that radiation pressure may play an important role in dwarf galaxy simulations. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Thanks,